So, um, my name is Rakesh Panchal. I work in Leicester in central England. I'd like to thank um, Hari Kishan um, and the Yashoda Group for this very kind invitation. It's great to be in Hyderabad. Uh, my wife grew up in Hyderabad. It's my first trip here. Um, and we've worked with the Yashoda Group previously on COVID webinars, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, pneumothorax management and some of the updates and new guidelines. So I work in Leicester. It's in central England. We're a university teaching hospital. And in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to talk you through a little bit about pneumothorax risk factors, the evidence base on managing primary and secondary pneumothorax, ambulatory management, suction, and surgery. So pneumothorax is not um, new. It's been around for time. All of you will be seeing patients with primary and secondary pneumothorax. And Hippocrates first came up with it as a succussion um, splash when patients used to have a hydropneumothorax. And obviously, Itard and Lanek um, gave much more elegant descriptions of it through time. So there is primary and secondary pneumothorax. Primary, we think of people as having normal lung, but that's not actually quite true, and I'll tell you about that shortly. And secondary, obviously, we know people have an underlying lung disease. And there's a bimodal distribution to pneumothorax. You'll know that your tall, thin young man gets it sort of a, with a post-pubertal spike, and obviously a second peak later on in life. So what are the pneumothorax risk factors? Well, obviously, you know Marfan's, there's um, cannabis smoking, tuberous sclerosis, diving, um, histiocytosis, lymphangiolime mimatosis, um, and catamenial pneumothorax. But there are other risk factors as well. Does anybody in the audience know who, the, who this group are? Dr. Mahajan knows the group. Absolutely. So who, who would have known that uh, listening to One Direction might be a risk factor for pneumothorax? But there is a case report on um, a girl whose lung collapsed after she was screaming at a One Direction conference, and, uh, a concert, sorry, and this was published, so uh, be careful. So historical management pneumothorax. So if you go back to Stradling's paper, and I'll talk about this shortly, with, pneumothorax used to be managed conservatively. And then the British Thoracic Society guidelines from 1993 started suggesting sort of aspiration first, and if that failed, followed by a chest drain. Then 2010 guidelines were again saying similar things, aspiration, if that fails, pneumothorax. And now the new guidelines, which as Professor Munova mentioned, will be out later this year, are adopting a more conservative approach um, and looking at ambulatory management of pneumothorax as well. And I'll talk about that shortly. So this was a, um, a survey of pneumothorax management in the UK. And in the first bar graph, you can see that in a large pneumothorax with minimal symptoms, about 50%, only 50% of the clinicians would manage it conservatively. And practice varies. About three, two thirds of people use suction if the pneumothorax is present after two days. 15% um, clamp the drain prior to removal and about um, only one fifth will use suction for resolution despite um, recommendations on using that. So does size matter? And this is the key question. So there's no international consensus on size. So the Belgian guidelines say a large pneumothorax is if you've got a circumferential edge all the way around the lung. The American guidelines um, said if, it, if the cupola apex of the cupola, the distance is more than two centimeters, that was large. And the British Thoracic Society guidelines say pneumothorax is large if um, at the level of the hilum, from the edge of the lung to the edge of the chest wall is more than two centimeters. But there are other methods, the Collins methods, looking at CT, the lights index, but there's poor correlation between them. So where are we in 2023? Well, size alone is not an indication for management anymore. High risk characteristics and symptoms are thought to guide management, and I'll talk about that shortly. So aspiration works in about 60% of cases, and if aspiration doesn't work, chest drain more than probably 70%, and obviously if that fails, then we refer our patients on to our thoracic surgical colleagues. So as I mentioned earlier, we think of primary pneumothorax as being a benign condition. You know, it happens in a normal lung, but that's not the case. We know a lot of these patients have subpleural blebs or bully, which may be detected on a CT, but we probably rarely do a CT in a young patient with a primary pneumothorax. Um, and there's also this theory of pleural porosity. So on the left, you can see this is Mark Noppen's paper um, from Belgium, I think, where they looked at fluorescein, inhaled fluorescein during thoracoscopy when he used to do it in patients who had had history of pneumothorax and no pneumothorax. Um, and we're undergoing sympathectomy. And you can see that there are sort of breaches in the visceral pleura. So there's been three main papers in the last few years um, in management of pneumothorax. The first is the New England paper from Australia, looking at conservative management of primary pneumothorax. Um, the the uh, paper from the UK by Rob Halifax uh, looked at ambulatory management of pneumothorax. 
using um, a plural vent device, and ambulatory management of secondary renal thorax. I'm going to go through these very briefly. So as you mentioned, I mentioned earlier on a paper in thorax from the 1960s which looked at about 120 patients, of 88 were supposed to have a simple pneumothorax, they didn't give a definition of that, and they just left them alone. They managed them conservatively if they had no symptoms. And in about 80%, it resolved by four weeks, and in the majority, it resolved by eight weeks. So one would say, well, why are we sort of wanting to intervene? And I think practice has changed. Our practice in um, plural medicine has changed from wide-bore surgical argyle drains to small Seldinger drains, which are thought to be more, be more benign. So this was the New England paper uh, looking at the randomized control trial in um, primary pneumothorax, and they looked at conservative management versus intervention. And the intervention wasn't standard BTS practice. They put a 12 French drain in for about four hours. And they looked at chest exo resolution at eight weeks, and they said that there was no difference between the two groups. However, there were some limitations in this paper. So it was over six years across around 40 centers in Australia, that's, they recruited eight per centre, and that's about one patient per year. And they had, sorry, they excluded 88% of patients, uh, including those that had a previous history of pneumothorax. So they only randomised about 12% of the patients they had. Additionally, a lot of these patients presented late. They had pneumothorax symptoms for at least um, one and a half days, and they had very low chest pain and breathlessness scores. So one would argue that perhaps this was already a cohort of patients who you would manage conservatively anyway and doesn't require intervention. And the BTS old guidelines, 2010, had already always mentioned that if the patient is stable with minimal symptoms, you can manage it conservatively. So that, that, that doesn't add anything particularly new. In Leicester, where I work, um, at the ERS in 2015, we uh, presented the first use of the ambulatory plural vent device um, in both primary and secondary pneumothorax. And this was evaluated further in the RAMP trial, which I'll talk about um, shortly. So the plural vent device um, is not available in India yet, but it will be available later this year. It's produced by Rocket Medical. It's an eight French catheter with an enclosed um, uh, chamber with a one-way Heimlich valve and a container to, to collect any flu that, that would collect as well. So I don't know if the video plays, yeah. So you can insert this either in the triangle of safety or the second intercostal space. Obviously, it eliminates the need for a chest drain and the patient's mobile and able to walk. There's a varus needle and once it's in, it's got a hydrocolloid fixing, and there's a diaphragm on the top which moves with respiration. Once the diaphragm stops moving, the pneumothorax may have resolved. There are other devices. So um, the plural vent is an 8 French, but there's a thorough vent, uh, which has an 11 and 13 French um, gauge as well. So as I said, ambulatory management is also not new. Fraser Brims, who's now in Australia, did a systematic review of quite a few years ago. Um, and found out, um, looked at about 18 studies, and they found out, outpatient treatment was successful in about 78% of patients, but a lot of these studies were moderate to poor with a high risk of bias. So the RAMP trial published in, in Lancet, which was randomized patients to standard aspiration and chest strain, or the ambulatory pleural vent device, and looked at hospital stay over 30 days and 12 month follow-up. They included patients with previous pneumothorax and included patients who smoked cannabis, um, which is quite commonplace in the UK when you ask patients with primary pneumothorax. Um, these patients had high chest pain and breathlessness scores. And they overall found that the ambulatory management arm, um, patients had reduced hospital stay um, and it, the pneumothorax resolved in an major fashion. However, those patients who had the plural vent device had more adverse events. Now, that's due to a very strict definition of adverse events in that anyone who had, any, who had a plural vent in and had any issue that required them coming to hospital was considered a serious, uh, serious adverse event. So it, was a, it, was a, it had a very strict uh, definition, which wasn't due to any problems with the um, plural vent device per se. So summarizing the two studies, the New England paper and the RAMP trial looking at ambulatory management, well, the, the New England paper was a highly selected population. Um, they chose stable patients who can be managed conservatively, but what it showed was that size didn't matter. In the ambulatory um, uh, RAMP trial, intervention was based on symptoms, not size. They showed that ambulatory devices work and that two-thirds of patients can be discharged the same day. 
And as Professor Munov has mentioned in the past, always apply the friends and family test. If one of your loved ones, or your children, or brother or sister, or somebody had a pneumothorax, what would you want for them? Would you want them to go through a chest strain unnecessarily? Would you prefer to imagine conservatively or have a device which make, is less invasive and makes them more, um, uh, allows them to sort of go home and imagine in an ambulatory fashion? The high-spec study looked at the plural vent on ambulatory management in secondary pneumothorax. So in this study, they gave a Heimlich valve called a 12 French drain in. It was quite difficult to recruit to because patients present to ED unwell. So the majority of them end up having a chest drain. So in this um, study, if they had no drain put in, they had a plural vent device, the eight French catheter put in. But if they already had a drain in situ, then they had um, a pneumostat device, which is the device at the bottom attached to it. So that attaches to a cell in a chest drain. However, in the plural vent arm, they had to stop it prematurely because in about 50% of cases, within a week, the patient required a chest strain because the pneumothorax got worse. So this is the pneumostat device which can attach to a chest strain. So in those patients with a secondary pneumothorax who had a plural vent device, there was a higher risk um, of subcutaneous emphysema, the device getting dislodged or blocked. So this study concluded that plural vent devices should not be used in secondary pneumothorax. They should be used in primary pneumothorax, perhaps because the breach of air is larger and the defect is larger. However, you can still manage secondary pneumothorax in selected cases in ambulatory fashion, and I'd say if you wanted to manage a secondary pneumothorax in an ambulatory fashion, put a chest drain in and attach a, pneumo a pneumostat device. How about pneumothorax reoccurrence? So in my clinic, my plural clinic, I always get asked by patients whether the once the pneumothorax is resolved, What's the chance of this happening again to me or my son or my daughter? So um, Steve Walker from Bristol did a systematic review of around 30 studies with just over 13,000 patients. And the one-year reoccurrence rate is approximately 32%. The greatest risk is in the first year. Um, being a female, the reoccurrence rate is higher, and obviously smoking cessation is, is um, very important, so it reduces the risk fourfold. How about flying? So if you get your second ipsilateral or your first contralateral pneumothorax, then you should be referred to the thoracic surgeons. But divers and pilots of high-risk occupations, you may want to refer them early. You'll know from Boyle's law, um, the pressure, the uh, volume, uh, sorry, as the pressure drops um, in a fixed space, the volume increases in size. So we avoid patients, we tell patients not to fly for a week after pneumothorax is resolved. And obviously no scuba diving unless they have definitive thoracic surgery. So how about surgery after first pneumothorax? I said, I mentioned high-risk occupations, so divers and pilots. So there was a Danish study which randomized patients to VATS, um, or they just had a chest strain, and they found out that the pneumothorax reoccurrence rate was obviously less if they had surgery first line, but I would argue 13% is still quite high. So there's a lack of real studies looking at um, surgery after first pneumothorax, but it's thought that if they've got a bulla or a bleb, or a large dystrophic lesion, then perhaps that might um, push you to uh, referring that patient for thoracic surgery. So there's something called the dystrophy severity score, um, and this looks at um, whether the patient has a bleb less than one centimetre, or a bully more than one centimetre, and whether it's single or multiple, or whether it's unilateral or bilateral, to classify patients into low and high grade. And you can see the five-year reoccurrence rate, there is a considerable difference there. In the UK, um, this is freely accessible. In clinical medicine last year, a British group um, we looked at patients who had a primary pneumothorax and assessed them according to the dystrophy score and put them into low grade and high grade and found out that obviously with high grade um, score, uh, intervening early after a first pneumothorax might be beneficial. And they put an algorithm together to say, manage the uh, pneumothorax as you might, put a chest drain in after 48 hours if there's no resolution, do a CT, calculate a dystrophy score, and if it's high, perhaps they may benefit from referral to the surgeon early. Just to end with, I'm going to quickly go through suction. So suction involves the application of negative pressure, and the theory is if you remove air, then the visceral uh, pleural breach, um, is facil you, you're facilitating resolution. But it's not routinely recommended by guidelines. And there is a risk of re-expansion of pulmonary edema, or, or perhaps you might be exacerbating the visceral um, pleural breach. So instead of allowing it to heal naturally, you're making it worse by putting the patient on suction. So a paper from 1982 that said, you shouldn't put people on suction. Um, it um, doesn't promote active lung expansion. It impairs healing of the lung defect. However, there are now digital suction devices around. So this is the, um, here you can see the Topaz device by Medella, and there's a, one produced by Rocket Medical. 
it provides, you attach it to the chest strain and it provides you a digital reading, so continuous um, real-time air leak data. Um, it gives you, you can set the pressure on it, minus 2.5, 5 kilopascals of pressure, and it's more accurate than wall suction. And the patient can ambulate with it, and it, you can then predict when the pneumothorax is resolved and potentially take the drain out rather than looking for the swing or if there's any bubbling. And this has also been evaluated in a number of studies, um, and it shows a signal that if you put someone on digital suction, it may promote, re you may be able to predict when the pneumothorax is resolved because if you have a, 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 a digital um, reading there. Um, and in the UK, there's going to be a study starting this year called a RASPA trial where any patients admitted to the primary pneumothorax requiring intervention um, are going to be randomized to um, suction or no suction to, see, to answer this question, does it promote early resolution or not? So the BTS guidelines, I'm sorry, I know you can't read this, but I'm going to, they're going to be published later this year, as Professor Munova mentioned. Um, they do focus on um, patient symptoms. So if the patient is not symptomatic, you could potentially manage it conservatively, but if they are symptomatic and they are high-risk characteristics, you're going to offer the patient the option. Do they want to avoid a procedure? And do you think they're stable enough to manage them conservatively? If they want rapid symptom relief, perhaps you might manage them ambulatory with a, a device. But if the patient is not keen on going home, then obviously you've got the old-fashioned needle, needle aspiration chest drain, which are the tried and tested methods. That's, I'll leave that there for a second if anyone wants to take a picture, but it will be published later this year. So upcoming studies. We've got the CONCEPT study, so the British um, study looking at uh, conservative management of pneumothorax, similar to the Australian study looking at whether needle aspiration versus chest strain might be beneficial in secondary pneumothorax, RASPA, which is looking at suction in primary pneumothorax, and the COMITED, which is looking at conservative management of traumatic pneumothoraces. So in summary, for primary spontaneous pneumothorax, conservative management may be an option in select patients. Size does not determine management. Symptoms guides management, and perhaps less is more Ambulatory devices work, and as I said, devices like the Plural Vent will be available in India later this year. In secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, ambulatory devices might work, but do not use small caliber 8 French, 12 French, uh, sorry, 8 French or 11 French ambulatory devices. Perhaps put a small 12 or 14 French or 16 French Seldinger drain in and use a pneumostat. Thank you.